let's wait for the participants to roll in. <clears throat> okay. In there we go. Okay. Okay, good afternoon to everybody joining us for our second session, Let's Talk Assessment. Uh, with our panel of guests, our esteemed panel of guests today. And um, we've got um, quite a number of you joining us in our session today. So we're just going to give it a couple of minutes for everyone to join us. Um, if you were, uh, if you attended Let's Talk Assessment one or two weeks ago, you'll know how the session is going to run. Um, but if you're new to this session, we'll explain as we run through um, how the session is going to work. Um, but we do have quite a number to actually let in. So I think it's a bit, little bit like a a, a filter trying to get everybody through bottleneck. Off a bottleneck that's the word I was bottleneck. looking for in this afternoon a bottleneck trying to get everybody in on time so um if you're we're going to give it a couple of minutes if you've got chance just go and grab yourself a cuppa and a drink um and you should have had a sketch note um to look at prior to the session today which we uh will might well, might refer to at some point as we as we come through depending on where i'm going to put it on the goes. screen now thank you finn there you go, there's our sketch. My, our blue Peter, here's our one prepared earlier. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we are still waiting. Uh, last time, I think we had over, well, nearly touching 200 participants join us, but I know some of you are watching this in school and participating actually as a staff in school, which is fantastic. Um, so we're just going to give a little bit of time um, to get everybody to join us this afternoon. Um, if you notice, if you haven't used... Um, Zoom webinar before, uh, you'll notice it, it looks slightly different. Um, the fact that your video and, and microphone will be off, um, but only our panelists at the moment can, can you can see um, and hear. At the bottom of your screen, you should have a question and answer function and also a chat function. Um, what we'd like you to do as we run through the session is we're going to use chat for that. So if you've got any comments that you'd like to just make over some of the, or on some of the questions that we're talking about, please use the chat function for that. But if you do have specific questions that you'd like to put to the panel, um, can we use the, the Q&A, the question and answer um, function, which is slightly different um, to, to put the questions to the panel. So it means the panel can see the questions and they can respond to them as we go through either live or um, through written, written text. So hopefully that will, that makes itself clear as we run through. And any technical issues, where should they put that? Uh, put technical issues in the chat because it's not <laughs> technically a, a question about the question about assessment, is it? No, it yeah, isn't. Just thought we'd check. Just to clarify that. So we are, we are a little bit mad this afternoon, aren't we? Yeah, it's just yeah. been a long day. So. But the you know the feedback we've had from session one has been has been great. So let's hopefully today um, we're going to have another good session um, with lots of discussion um, as we run through. And again, we are going to record or well, we are recording this session. And um, so you will once we've edited it, you will get a copy of this uh, at some point next week. So you'll have session one and session two, and then hopefully session three when we come back in September. So we're just waiting for a few more to join us. There's a little bit of uh, dribs and drabs popping in, but I know lots of people have emailed us to say that things have again cropped up in school. Yeah. So they will be accessing the recording um, a little bit later. So we're just going to wait a couple more minutes and then we'll make a start. Um, many, many thanks for you, to you as well. If you answered the survey question that came out with a sketch note um, a week or so ago, that's been really helpful because that's going to link into our very first poll that we're going to use today um, and we do have some polls as we run through the session as well so we'll, we'll we'll do this in the same way we'll we'll do a poll have some discussion around that with the with the questions as well so we're going to give it another minute for everybody to join us just one more minute and then I think we'll make a yeah. start because the introduction I think we can uh... we do appreciate that people are very very busy and, yeah. but it's at the end of the day it's finding that optimum time isn't it to get yeah. everybody um online online yes and listening so uh here we go okay so well, there's still people joining as we speak yes well okay so <laughs> shall we shall we make a start anyway even though people are still joining i'm sure they can catch up when they're um in the in the room so to speak okay well welcome everybody to our second let's talk assessment event uh, I'm delighted that we've got a, a fantastic panel here for you again. Uh, and 
as we mentioned last time, just in case anybody isn't aware of why we put together these sessions, it's because we really want to focus in on this open, honest discussion about assessment in Wales, because it's such an important subject and we really need to talk about it before uh, we're at September 2022 and we're, we're already doing it. And we had an amazing response to our last session, not just um, those people who were, uh, had reserved tickets and actually turned up to it and were able to see it live, but we've also had lots and lots of people um, downloading uh, the, well, not downloading, but watching the video through YouTube, um, even watching it in, in departments or in um, senior leadership teams and actually using it as discussion point in their school, which is fantastic. So thank you for everybody who's already taken part in that kind of process. We wanted to um, remind everybody that our panellists, who I'm going to introduce you all to in a second, are, are just the same as you. They are ordinary teachers, senior leaders, uh, staff in school in exactly the same position as you are. The only difference between them and you is they have uh, taken the very brave decision to actually be on our panel and put themselves up for this discussion in a public space about assessment, which I think is absolutely amazing. So thank you very much, panellists, all of you for, for doing that. Um, it's a gutsy thing to do. So we're going to use the hashtag Let's Talk Assessment today. So if you want to carry on the conversation on Twitter or you want to comment on anything that's happening, please do use the hashtag Let's Talk Assessment and carry on that discussion in the real world. Um, we're delighted not just to have our panellists, but also experts providing a film every uh, week uh, or every time we do these sessions to explore the focus of each of the sessions. Today's expert is Daisy Christodoulou. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about Daisy later, but um, she's provided a film. She's not with us today, but she's provided a film for us to explore the, uh, the process. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jane to introduce all of our uh, esteemed panel members. Thank you, Finn. So just to introduce um, our panel members, some of you will notice that we, we do have some very familiar faces from our first session, um, but we've also got some very brave uh, new additions to our panel. So thank you very much as well. So they are colleagues from Wales. There's a range of experience within our panel again, as Finn said, from both in the classroom and leadership. Or, and, and leadership. Um, so again, it's real people from real schools. So thank you very much. So we've got uh, Barry Mock, welcome Barry, who's Welsh lead at risk of competence. If you want to wave Barry so people can see you. One, he's one of the people behind 15 minute forum. Uh, we've got Dave Stacey. Um, Dave is, if I can remember your title, Dave, I can never remember it, your senior lecturer at uh, Trinity St. David. Is that right? Yeah, I answer to most things. Senior oh, yeah, lecturer, okay, body, I make the tea, you know, well, anything. Well, well, we'll stick with senior lecturer because I think that's, that's the best one, isn't it? Uh, we've got uh, Damien Benny, who's deputy head teacher at Penarail. Welcome, Damien, again. Um, and I know we had, just going back to Dave as well, we had the pleasure of Dave's film last, last time, so uh, Dave didn't participate in the panel. Um, but Dave is, uh, is going to participate today. Uh, Damien is our uh, deputy head from Penarail, who's a science teacher, and he's very active in the world of research in form. So anybody on Twitter will know who Damien is. Um, we've got um, one of our new panelists, Sam Eaton. Welcome, Sam. Um, assistant head teacher from Learning and Teaching from Cardiff High. Um, any of you know who listen to our podcast know that we we did a podcast with Sam. We forgot to record it, so we will, you'll know that one. Um, from our all, all of those are from our secondary um, sector. Uh, from primary, we've got, we've got Andy Keegan again. Welcome, Andy. Uh, thank you for joining us from Point Clue Primary in Swansea um, and someone who's been an interrogator of changes to education in Wales um, throughout. And we'd also like to welcome from the special uh, sector, um, which we didn't have represented last time, but I think it's really important we have today, Rachel George. Welcome, Rachel, who's SLT and curriculum lead at Uskol Mysokoid in Neath. So welcome. And I haven't missed anyone off, have I? Brilliant. Oh, apart oh, from oh, uh, Jane oh, yes. and Finn, just in go. case, just go. in case. Um, before uh, we talk about the film, I just wanted to uh, say to everybody who's viewing this, uh, whether live or um, recorded, that uh, in our discussion before we started this session, I think the panel has all agreed that this is a tough one today. There may well be lots of questions that we've got written down on our list, but nobody's quite sure of the answer. So we wanted to kind of put that up front and say that this is this is a toughie, but this is part of the process is actually 
um, talking about these things and, and being honest and saying, well, we don't know at this stage. We don't know how we can uh, manage that or how that's even going to work or even what that is. So let's let's put that up front that, you know, we are just um, professionals, just like everybody else. So be kind. OK, so today. Our film is from Daisy Christodoula, who's director of No More Marking, uh, an education company focused on assessment. So just, I'm just gonna set up the film for everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna just uh, do the technical stuff. While well, you're doing the technical stuff, can I just remind those of you who might've joined us a little bit later, um, that we are gonna use the chat function at the bottom for any comments on some of the discussions that we're gonna have. But if you do have specific questions that you'd like to put to the panel, can we use the question and answer function um, alongside it so we don't, don't muddy up the two? So just so we've got really clear, so our panel can actually answer the questions that go in the question and answer. Hi everyone, I'm Daisy Christodoulou, the Director of Education at No More Marking. And in this short video, I'm going to talk to you about understanding group progress in order to reflect on practice. And the outline of what I want to talk about is as follows. First of all, I want to talk about the type, type of progress you're looking at and the types of different progress. And secondly, I want to talk to you about confidence intervals and remind you to be aware of them, particularly when you're looking at the results from small groups. OK, so. The first thing I want to do is think about the type of progress that you're looking at. And you might think at first that maybe I'm overcomplicating things here, but the reason I want to talk about this distinction is that I feel that it's often a really big source of confusion in schools and among students. Um, and it, often it's the case that departments end up talking across purposes with each other because uh, of this distinction. So one type of progress you can, you can use is to think about age independent progress. Um, so let me give you an example of what I mean by age independent progress. This is when you would give pupils a grade or a score that would represent their absolute performance. So, for example, um, if you gave a class of year 10s at the start of their GCSE course a whole GCSE paper and you marked it according to the end of course mark scheme, the grade that the student got uh, from, 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 from that assessment, that would be an age independent grade. You'll be saying that's what you, you would get if you took a GCSE at this moment in time. And at no more marking. Uh, we use age independent scores for our primary writing assessments. Um, and so what that means is if you're getting a score of 520 in one assessment and then a year later you get 520, you haven't made progress. If you stay on the same score, it means you stayed at the same standard. And that would be the same with the GCSE. If you got uh, a grade E or a grade, a grade three in one assessment and you got the same grade a year later, you wouldn't have made progress. Um, but we can also think about age related progress, which is something different. And this is where you pupils are given a grade or a score that reflects their position within their age cohort. And you can use GCSE grades like this too. So sometimes I see schools who will give pupils GCSE grades in year seven. And if they give a pupil in year seven a grade nine or an A star, that doesn't mean that they think that student would get a grade nine or A star if they took the GCSE the very next day. It means that they kind of basically just mean this is a top performing year seven um, and perhaps I think they're on the pathway to, to get a grade nine uh, or, or an A star at the end of um, uh, at the end of their time at secondary school. Um, and you can also have something similar with standardised assessments. A lot of reading and maths standardised assessments are standardised so that 100 always represents average performance for each age group. Um, so what that means is if um, I, I'm age seven and I get a standardised score of 100 and I'm age 15 and I get a standardised score of 100, um, uh, I actually have made progress because I'm working at the expected standard for a year seven, uh, for, for a seven year old, and I'm working at the expected standard for a 15 year old. Um, so in that case, the, the pupils getting the same number, but they have made progress. Um, so why does this matter? Well, hopefully you can see each system is, is, is fine. It works fine uh, internally on its own. The problem uh, comes when you start to mix systems. It can get quite confusing. And the reason why it matters is because obviously if you are using age independent grades and staying the same is not making progress. Staying the same means you are you, you, you're not improving the standard you're producing is not going up. Whereas with age related grades, actually staying the same is making progress. If you stay on the same grade or you stay on the same uh, standardised score, you, you are making progress. Um, so either approach is fine. Um, but what I've seen in a lot of schools is it 
schools will use one approach in one subject, a different approach in another, another. Often a maths department will often be quite wedded perhaps to an age independent approach. Uh, and often I see English departments who are, uh, are more used to an age related approach. Um, and what, that can be very confusing for, for students when they're getting grades that really mean different things. And it can be quite confusing as well, I think, for senior management if they're trying to work out uh, if pupils really are uh, dramatically improving somewhere in one subject and not in another, or if it's actually just an artefact of a, of a different grading system. So I think that's one thing to, to really be aware of. Um, so what I'll do now is just show you some graphs from uh, some of the reports we produce at No More Marking for the, the primary writing assessment we do, where we do use age independent progress and what you would expect to see. So the dark blue here is all schools. And you can see what this chart is showing. Uh, there's three data points for all schools. And you can see that um, these are the average scores for uh, all the pupils who took part in year one, for all the pupils who took part in year two, and for all pupils who took part in year three. And you can see something which uh, is really quite dramatic, but is borne out by other research, which is that pupils make enormous progress between year one and year two. Uh, and actually that's borne out in lots of other research too, not just uh, our assessments, that pupils make more progress in those early years at school than they do in, in the later years. They, they really make come on leaps, leaps and bounds. And you can see that here. So really dramatic progress from year one to year two. And there's still uh, a bit of progress from year two to year three, um, but, but not quite as much. You know, it does sort of, sort of level off a bit. Um, so, so that's interesting. Uh, so that's what you can see from all schools. And then what's really interesting is underneath this, in the light blue, we can see one individual school's results. And this is fascinating because we can see that they are tracking the same kind of trajectory that you would see uh, nationally. But can you see they're starting from um, a much lower position? So these are pupils who are coming in in year one, well below the national average. OK, and you can see that in that gap there. Uh, and the pupils do make very uh, big progress in, in from year one to year two, as happens nationally. And actually, they make probably a little bit more progress than nationally. This is even a bit steeper than the, the national picture. So they're making up some of that gap. And similarly, from two to three, uh, it, it levels off, uh, as you would expect to see, uh, because that's what we see nationally. But it doesn't level off as much as it does nationally. So, again, this is a school where people are coming in behind. Um, they are still behind by the end of uh, year, by, by, by this is uh, the start of year three, actually. But they are making back some of some of some of those those gaps. And I think why this is so interesting is obviously if you're an individual school, it's really important for you to see the national progress next to your progress, because otherwise you can't really contextualise it. It's hard for you. If all you had here was your school's results, you might be thinking to yourself, goodness, we have really uh, got a problem here because we make all this progress from one to two and then they level off. So something's going badly wrong. But actually, when you look at it here, you can actually flip it around and say this is a school who are doing better than the national in two to three. Um, actually, then they're doing one to two. Uh, they, they're making back kind of more of those gains relative to the national picture. So really important to get a kind of national comparison uh, to have a look at. Um, and then um, final thing I want to talk about is confidence intervals. Really important to be aware of confidence intervals, particularly when you're dealing with small groups. So again, we've got here some, some data from an, a no more marking assessment. And here on the left, uh, the purple dot, that's the average score from all of the pupils who took part in one of our assessments. And you can see in the chart above that dot there, that purple dot represents 37,200 37, pupils. It's a lot of pupils. Whereas this pink dot here only represents the 29 pupils in this one individual school. Um, and that's why this pink dot has those confidence intervals and why the purple dot doesn't, because the purple dot is representing so many pupils that there really isn't kind of a, that, that, that same confidence interval. We can be much more certain about the average of those pupils because there's so many of them. Whereas with these 29 pupils, what we're saying is well, that average really could have been skewed by a couple of outliers, one particular student having a good or bad day. Whereas with the bigger number, those things kind of cancel each other out. So that's why we've got this confidence interval for the smaller group. And then when you have even smaller groups, as you will, if you start splitting down this group into people premium, not people premium, the confidence intervals get even bigger. So here we go. This is uh, uh, this school uh, split out into people premium, not people premium. And we can see that this is a school that only has two people premium students. So um, the confidence intervals are, are even bigger. And, and really, that's when it gets to the point where it can be quite hard. You don't really you know to be tracking trends over time with just a, a, a really small number of people with a big confidence interval does become really tricky and it's something you should be should be wary about. Um, so to finish, I've got three key questions for you uh, to think about based on what I've said here. What do you mean by progress in your school? Uh, what do you mean by it? 
And does everyone in your school have the same understanding? All the teachers, all the students, the uh, parents, um, do, do they understand the same thing by it? And finally, when you're looking at the progress of small groups, do you take into account confidence intervals? So those are three questions which I hope will be interesting for you to reflect on, and I hope you found this useful. Thanks for your time. So that's fantastic to have uh, Daisy's film there, and I think they certainly gave us uh, lots to think about. Before um, I do a, a technical shift so that we can uh, move on, I just wanted to remind everybody, because I didn't before the film, that today's session is actually about understanding group progress in order to reflect on practice, which is the statement of one of the purposes of assessment as outlined in the Curriculum for Wales document. So while I do uh, the technical um, thing, yeah. Jane's going to take over. I'm just going to pick up on a question that uh, Lynn has put in into the question and answer, which Dave has kindly responded. I'm not sure if everybody can see that, but I'll just um, talk about that. On the graph, what is providing the scores is a set tests test. And Dave quite rightly said it's, it's the no more market system, which is um, comparative judgment activities that would be set activities for each year group that are um, that everyone who who buys into the no, uh, no more marking system will then get their pupils to do and then those are all uh, looked at and the, the whole judgment system works around that so that's the, that that's what that data relates to right before we move on to any questions for the panel so you can just you've got a couple of moments before we start uh, grilling you is we have put together some polls for today. And one of the polls that we've put together is that first question from Daisy's film, which is what is progress? And we had we actually sent out a survey to everybody who was participating uh, today to just ask them that question and to just have a short, to write their own sentence in response to what is progress, that question. And what we've done is we've taken a, uh, a number of those responses and put them in a poll and we've taken a really a, as wide a range as we possibly could so in the poll the options for you is you can uh, you can tick as many as you like so any that you think uh, you feel you agree with please do tick them and I think we'll run that poll now uh, there it is so tick as many of those as you feel that you agree with and let's just see what that brings up so I'm just going to uh, be quiet while you read it It's, it's funny when you're watching the polling, all of a sudden it just comes in and everybody, uh, all the, the numbers change. It's very it's interesting. Like Eurovision to watch. Thing, it is. It? It's like Eurovision. Nil point. <laughs> okay, we, we have got a, uh, a winner here, one that's oh, more popular nope. than others. Lead is changing. Oh, is it? Oh, yes, it is. Right, we'll give it another few seconds. It's still changing. It'll be interesting to see the response. To, to respond. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to share that because I think we've got to the point where yeah, it's settling it's down a bit. Yet. Okay, so we have a clear winner. Jane, do you want to go through any talk about any okay, of those? Okay, so we've got um, moving forward with learning is the one of the most popular if that was changing that was changing lead with uh, positive growth and change right the way through so those two seem to be the ones that uh, most people felt that they seem to, to agree with um, and the one that people agree less with is the development of excellence over time mm. which is quite an interesting one I'm sure we're going to come back to this poll mm. yeah um, at a later yeah maybe we'll have a look at the end and see if people's opinions have changed or they've, they've stayed the same thanks Jane okay Okay, so uh, let's let's think about that as a panel then. Um, I think it's really important to start off with a shared understanding of what the, the word progress actually means. So would anybody like to offer um, any uh, any opinions on what you think progress is? And I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to wave at me. I did say volunteers only, or are you all too shy to not, <laughs> or to go on Barry, thank you Barry. First of all, it's a really, really difficult question, I think, um, because it can mean so many different things in so many different circumstances. So um, I like to think of it in as a twofold thing, because there is academic progress 
and then there's personal growth. And I don't think you can actually separate the two things. Um, it's, it's for me, you know, an accumulation of knowledge and a growing ability of skill um, and being able to, you know, transfer that knowledge into new contexts appropriately. Um, but I think that that can only happen as the confidence um, of the individual grows. Um, and so, you know, it would be nice to be able to pin progress down to it's this and it's this. But I think like assessment itself, it's far, far bigger. And I, I don't, you know, you've got to take in different aspects of it, although that doesn't help, of course, in terms of accountability. Yeah, and I'm sure we will get on to accountability uh, later on today. Is there anybody else? Sam, yes, you wanted to say something, then Rachel. I, th I think really just, just come in on building on what on what Barry said. I think for me, I kind of split it into three things. I think it's that sense of the person, and a lot of that can be about your kind of like your motivation and your self-esteem and how you feel about, you know, whatever it is you're, you're learning. And then it's you as a learner, which again can be influenced by the things that you are as a person. And that can differ from subject to subject. That can differ from week to week actually, but, and, and then the learning and the experience of learning that you get. So, you know, it is so, so hard, I think to, to, you know, and within that then I think there are lots of different branches and strands of what that actually means and what that actually looks like in a classroom. So I, I know, you know, we made the joke that we're going to say this this afternoon that this is really complex, but it is really complex. I don't think, I don't think there is a short answer or a snappy definition if I'm, no, if I'm no. really honest. Yeah, so Rachel, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm gonna put a, a slightly different perspective on it because um, from our point of view within the ALN sector, we don't view progress as, as being linear. Sometimes it involves us actually taking a few steps back and for our learners be, being able to consolidate and to, to make different links and that will lead to, to a little bit more progress so um i think it, it, it's that maria montessori quote isn't it that progression isn't linear and i think that's a really important thing for for us to remember as well at this point yeah and i think that that description of progress not being linear when you start to think about all of the things that you've mentioned already that progress can be um, academic progress it can be your personal growth it can be your 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 values even it can be you know your how you behave as a person when you're thinking about the fact that it's it's all those things then it gets to be really complex when you think well what does it look like in terms of um how that that moves forward or comes back or whether it's uh, uh, that it's not linear that it can move forward and back and sideways and all kinds of things and I think if we go back to the, um, the title of today, Understanding Group Progress in Order to Reflect on Practice, I, I'm going to throw, throw you a curveball before we've even really started, is I just want to go back to say, if, if this understanding of progress is such a difficult concept, uh, or the defining of progress is such a difficult concept, then how do you feel that we are going to understand group progress what's what's the challenge for teachers out there uh dave you've got your hand up and you're muted there you are i have i know just damien's hand up was first so i don't know Damien's... oh right okay sorry it's oh, on, Dave, like right. yeah he's on, just Dave, you carry on. Yeah, so I, i've got we, i've got this one right how um, do you understand group progress dave yeah it's it, it's really tricky isn't it and I, I'm, I'm i'm actually going to chuck another another question into that which is also the question of why it, we spent a lot of time last time talking about the uh, uh, understanding of where the individual learner was and how they were developing and how they were progressing in all that variety of, uh, of ways that the, the, the colleagues on the panel have just talked about. So given that, why do we then want to know about different groups? And I think part of it, and one of the concerns all the way through, and I think it's always been our concern ever since that first set of PISA results, is how do we know if we're doing, if, if this school system that we're creating, how do we know if it's how do we know if it's working? And as part of that, we've got to be honest about what we can measure and some of the things that we can't in a way that allows us to, 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 be, uh, to, to make those comparisons. There, there was a comment in, in the chat about a sense of disappointment about focusing on numbers and graphs. And, and maybe we've got to be honest about what the numbers and graphs can do 
and let them do that bit. So the stuff that no more marking and comparative judgment does, for example, I, I, hands up, I haven't been part of it, but every time I've seen it, it feels like it's quite a good system. It allows qu quick judgments, but it's socially allows discussion about teaching and learning. But with that, we need an honest account of what we what we can't do with that. And so there are things that are individual and holistic, but we can't, I, I don't think we can just say, and therefore we're not going to have these difficult and hard conversations about what, what progress is and, and how we make those group comparisons, because ultimately we're going to need to know as a school, or our, is our curriculum doing the things that we hoped it would do? As a nation, is our education system doing the things that we want it to do? And we have to be very careful that in trying to answer those questions, we don't have this negative washback that we've had so many times before, where we've tried to measure something and the, me the measuring of the thing has become more important than the thing. And, and, and we've had that kind of um, negative washback. That was a really inelegant sentence, but I hope you, you kind of yeah. get it. And I, I think when we're, when we're talking about what progress is and the fact that progress can be made in areas other than uh, academic progress, then we are thinking about, well, if, if we're potentially um, the expectation is measuring it, then we need to have some kind of framework. And how do you start to uh, put a framework together of progress in empathy, for example? Uh, Damien, did you want to add something to uh, what Dave said or come in on a different point? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, defining progress is incredibly difficult because um, like learning is invisible and progress we, we, we sort of all know is is making is making progress in learning and moving that forward but of course that's invisible in a group of 30 that's that's you know invisible times 30 so we have to somehow measure progress uh, and that's difficult enough um again this sort of summative assessments right but then assessment needs to be linked with tracking needs to be linked with reporting but they're not they're not the, the three things are not the same no. um I, I just think one of the key things that we can do about um look at a sort of group progress is it does allow us to make some inferences about the curriculum that we're delivering is it is it coherent enough is it is it ambitious enough um we can make some decisions about the sort of pedagogical choices that that, that are taking place but what we don't want to ever bring it back to is um you know what what's the group score in, in this classroom compared to the group score in that classroom that teacher's are doing a great job that teacher's not good enough you know that that's really missing the point to think about about group progress so it's just for me it's about the the we need to be take care with this, but it's the inferences we can make about uh, about our curriculum, our curriculum decisions, and about our, our pedagogical choices uh, to deliver that curriculum too. So, would you say then that uh, in in looking at the purpose of um, uh, assessment as it's defined in Curriculum for Wales, understanding group progress in order to reflect on practice, that we need to be really, really clear as to what we mean by the progress that is reasonable and sensible and a common sense approach to actually reflect on and that which it is not reasonable and not um, sensible to reflect on um, in that way. Uh, yes, 100%, absolutely. Okay. Um, that would be an ecumenical matter as well, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. We, we discussed that there are some questions that we probably don't want to answer today, but we're, we're gonna do, give it our best. Andy, do you want to add something from the primary perspective? Yeah, I think the... A lot of what's already been said is kind of uh, something that I wanted to point out. You've done what the children do in school and you've taken all my answers. But um, one of the points that was made in the chat that I'm just going to pick up on and something that you said, Finn, was, you know, how do you put a framework together to, um, to assess things like empathy and those kind of inner things that you can't put onto a graph or a chart and things like that. Those, those things that you naturally see. Um, progression in, across the area with, with your, the children in front of you and the students in front of you. And I think something it comes down to is um, trust and moving away from um, school judgment based on purely your numbers that are in front of you and being able to sit there and actually say, well, actually, do you know what? I know my children inside out at this point of the year. I know, you know, I, I'm someone who's quite fortunate in a way that I've worked in, uh, I work in primary now, but I was also a, a secondary teacher as well. And actually that's a very difficult thing to do for secondary teachers when you've got, you know, mm -hmm. 300 children coming through your doors. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. But as a primary teacher, I'm, I'm with my 29 students day in, day out, you know, with COVID as an exception all the time. So I, I could tell you name by name how much progress they've made, not necessarily just on an academic level, but on a personal level. 
Um, and I, I think just zoning in on, on numbers is maybe um, a little bit short-sighted. Um, something that, the, if you've read Daisy's book about assessment, she talks about something called tacit knowledge where you, there it is right there, you, where you just know deep inside that something is good, someone has made progress. You can't necessarily explain it exactly, but you know um, the, just the way that they are behaving, the way that they have changed, where they've grown as people. Um, but the difficulty there is how, how, do you, um, yeah. how do you evidence that? And I, 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 think I, think, I think we're getting into now this, this sort of tension between assessment um, yeah. from a professional perspective and accountability and having to measure and evidence and what have you. And it sounds to me like what a lot of you are saying is that um, looking at progress and understanding progress, we need to rely on potentially the, um, the professional judgment of the teachers in front of those pupils, that it seems to me that that's, that's where we need to go. Um, Barry, uh, and, and then Sam, do you want to add something? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there needs to be a change in mindset, right? We've we've come through a very difficult period in education, I think, where we went, the, the pendulum swung too far that we can measure these things and then make judgments either against each other or against, you know, teachers in schools or whatever. Right, I, I, right let's get rid of that. It's not worth it. Let, that's, let's hope that that stays in the past. However... You know, what's interesting in all these discussions is that, you know, what's the purpose? What is what is the purpose of us doing these these this tracking, this group progress and analyzing all of that? Well, surely the answer to that is it needs to be diagnostic. It is there for those teachers and for the you know line managers and leaders to take a hard look at those things and say, right, what is this telling us? Is this telling us that maybe there's a weakness in the way that we're approaching doing this? And what can we do then to address that? And then maybe put some procedures in place that would address that change in pedagogy, um, change in approach, whatever, and to see if that has a positive impact on that area that we've identified that is a problem. Now, can I, can I it, just, sorry, Barry, no, no, to fine. cut in, but you said something really important there, and Sam, I'm just gonna put you on hold as well. This idea of using assessment for diagnostic purposes. If we go back to um, Daisy's film, where she showed the graph and she showed the, uh, the national progress, and then she showed an individual school's progress and saying without the national comparison there, it was difficult to see how much progress that group was making, whether it was in uh, uh, quote unquote, the expected progress. And I think that's one of the things that we pulled out of the statement in Curriculum for Wales, um, right at the beginning uh, before we started was that um, they say in the statement whether different groups of learners are making expected progress. So looking at the Curriculum for Wales documentation that we currently have there with the descriptions of learning under the progression steps which are broadly linked to um, age uh, relationship, there's a, a, a relationship there. Um, do you feel that the curriculum documents at the moment allow us to actually say what the expected progress is? Anybody, I'm looking for offers. So if you don't wish to answer that one, put your hand down. Oh, Dave is uh, yeah, waving his real hand. So Dave gives a shout yeah, out. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't find the hands up button. It was easy. That's to okay, wave. real hands work too. <laughs> real hands work too. Um, I, um, I, I think there is, um, we're back to this thing about what are we using them for and the descriptions of learning are not designed to be if you were going to design a system that was going to benchmark you wouldn't design the one we've got because it's designed for a different purpose right the interesting thing about no more marking is the way in which they have designed these activities and there isn't a sense of we are we are going in with this expectation the system allows you to have a look at what these children are doing and then you get the data and the comparisons from it. And it feels to me as though that is a better way round, similar to the conversation we had at the end of last time about whether the descriptions end up being a, a cage rather than a scaffold. So we can draw this up if we can come up with a system that allows us to, uh, to sample and check in with how our learners are doing, 
rather than one that we have these preconceptions that we then try and measure students against and then we get tied up in language and what does this mean and, and all that mess that we've ended up in, in when we've tried to use levels and GCSE descriptions in the, in, in the past. So to me it feels like it's that way round and then we can we can get it. If we look for expectations in the descriptions of learning, we're looking in the wrong place for the wrong thing. And I think that your, your first comment there, um, that the curriculum for Wales descriptions of learning progression steps are not designed to be a benchmark. It'll be very interesting to see how that shapes up in terms of policy and uh, accountability. Sam, would you like to add something? And then I think we're going to go to a poll. Yeah, although I feel like now there are so many points that I've got loads of things sort of like um, just rattling around my head. I think a couple of things, really. It, it's that idea of, you know, that data that we use within schools and the kind of data that we're collecting on our students should be a starting point for conversations about how we are able to support them to to develop in a, in a whole range of ways it isn't and it shouldn't be and I think for too long it probably has been a summary of what they've done and a way of measuring ourselves against other people or, or looking you know as you said as an accountability measure and it's shifting that mindset to, to thinking about you know data can do data are children they tell us some things about students what they've done what they haven't done and then it's about asking the questions why haven't they got there? What's the problem? What's the barrier? How do we intervene? How do we support that? And I think if we can think about that as a, as a process in their journey, then, th then I'm not sure we need to benchmark in quite the same way. We need actually to get so hung up on it. And, 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 and I know that sounds, I don't mean that to sound sort of, you know, facetious or, or overly simplifying it, but, but I think it's, you know, we do this all the time within our classrooms as teachers as practitioners this is what we're doing and it's it's I think starting those having those dialogues within schools and with senior leaders because let's be honest sometimes we we don't help matters with the systems that we impose <laughs> within our schools in order to try and you know demonstrate that progress has been made and well, don't I get me started no, I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, I think that's a really interesting point with starting of professional conversations and I think there's an awful lot within the special school um, situation that, um, that, sorry, my Siri on my iPad across the room is shouting at me at the moment, sorry. Um, the, uh, going back to special schools and how um, you use um, that kind of data to have really deep conversations, don't you, Rachel? Yeah. Sorry, I'm right. taking off, take off of me. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose for us, um, it's we look at the holistic picture of our learners and and we find that from from our data so we celebrate their strengths whatever they may be and with our learners sometimes they can the progress um can be so nuanced it can be so so tiny that you know we still need to celebrate it we still need to recognize it and then we look then at what our next steps we're going to are going to be and with some learners we discuss and with other learners you know we try and make we try and make everybody a part to gather their voice but I would also like to put that um progress we use the word progress but also we use the word growth mm. as well and I think possibly growth is a is a better way of looking at it within our session with within our, our ALN area where we look at and celebrate the growth of the individual as a holistic being. Well, I th I, thank you. I think that's really interesting. And I think um, it may be, I mean, it'd be interesting to see that because special schools, the progress within special schools is so nuanced and is so individual to pupils. It's almost like you've been uncoupled from the expectation of accountability that way. And maybe there's something there that mainstream schools really could benefit from is that uncoupling of some outside expectation that the, as uh, Curriculum for Wales documents say, the expected progress we've made. It's, it'd be interesting to see who is going to define expected progress, whether it's going to be within school or across a cluster, across a region, across a nation. Can I, can I just pick up? We're working on um, at the moment within um, our cluster. We've got a, a meeting next week to look at how we are going to address this this growth for, for yeah. our learners and, and how we are going to be able to celebrate them and and their unique strengths. An important so, discussion. Um, yeah, let you know how that goes. 
Well, while we're still talking about ALL learners, Rachel, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. There's, there is a, a question that's that's come into the into the chat. The problem from an ALN point of view is that we have to evidence that a child is working at a level significantly below their peers. How can we do this without using comparative data? So I wouldn't use comparative data. I'm sorry, that learner is an absolute individual and needs to be celebrated and yeah. seen as, a, as an individual and whatever strengths, no matter what they are, they should be celebrated. And if you are possible to have a discussion with the learner to plan for the next steps. Yeah, so th this is the constant tension yeah. between what is needed yeah. to be done for, um, for um, purposes outside of education. And let's face it, accountability is to a certain extent outside yeah. of education, because they're, they're now talking about democratic accountability in the, uh, the evaluation process. But yeah. let, let's run a, a I was just poll. Say that, that, just, that fits very much with something that Kate has also said that, that links with what you said, but ultimately that's what teachers on the ground will still be asked to do. We're talking about that, but pedagogical, pedagogically inspirational, the concept of this is, um, we will still be asked to mark and track whatever the progression st points state. Yeah, so we've got a, a, another poll now here um, about the measurement of progress. So uh, have a look at this one and uh, let's see uh, what you all think of this one. Gosh, <laughs> we have a clear oh, yeah. winner on this one, a clear winner. I think interesting. it's interesting to see the proportion of those that are beginning to shift to curriculum for Wales, the, the descriptions of learning. Hmm. And I think we just need to um, give a caveat for this one as well, that uh, obviously at the moment, Welsh Government has just published some uh, guidance about assessment during this term. And as has been the case since the beginning of COVID, um, there is no expectation to assess directly against national curriculum levels uh, that um, this is a kind of transition period now between now and September 2022 where the choice is yours. I think we can all guess what the results of this one are yeah. going to be. Okay so let's share them. It's uh, really a real uh, huge difference. I think it'd be interesting if any of you have answered something else in there. If you're, um, particularly if you're in mainstream schools, because I think the large majority of our participants are in mainstream schools. I know that ALN is interesting, but I think it's, uh, we want to hear from people in similar contexts sometimes. Um, could you just put in the chat uh, what that something else is? I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I, I also want to go back to something that, that Rachel has responded to. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so we, the, the, this whole idea of this holistic view of pupils, maybe that this is something where our special schools can support the mainstream sector. Mm. And I think it's something that special schools, you've done very, very well for a long time. And I think it's something that the other sectors need to start looking at as well. OK, can we close that poll? And then the I want to go now to we, we've talked about a lot of the questions that I think were uh, raised by Daisy's film. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into confidence bounds at the moment, because I think that's maybe a, a, a technical step too far for some of us. That's, that's another. Yeah. Let's talk assessment. in it. Yeah, it, it certainly is. Um, I, I want to go to some of the questions that we've been uh, receiving on DMs over the last week or so. Um, and one of the questions, and I think this is probably a really common um, challenge for people out there when they're looking at curriculum for Wales. Somebody has asked, there are so many assessment progression steps. Where do I start? What advice, panellists, might you give someone who, who's coming up with that question, especially in primary, but I think uh, also in secondary? There are so many assessment or progression steps. Where do I start? Okay, <laughs> Andy, Andy, great, thank you. Andy, oh, that, that, that's a monstrous question, isn't it? You know, it um, is. You know, when when you look at it from because what one of my roles is is to look through. I've I've pretty much read every single progression step from progress step one to three, and well they are numerous. There are many, many, many um, individual little things. Um, and I think this actually comes back to um, Dave's video from last week is you have to start by looking at your what, what you want to achieve within your curriculum and 
it has to be done as, as, a, as a whole. I don't think you can pick one specific progress step and say, right, I'm going to start there because it depends on, um, it depends on a number of different things. And something that hasn't been touched on, I don't know whether it's changed or whether people just have forgotten about it, is that the progress step, like pr the progress steps have got age categories attached to them as well. They so do. progress step one is technically by end of reception, age five. Progress step two is age eight. Progress step three is age 11. So with that in mind, then we've already been kind of told that's probably where you should be starting. However, that might not be the right way to go about it. Um, but even within those, those age boundaries are quite large. You know, progress step three covers what is now year four to year six. And what you probably have to start thinking about is, um, can you then split those up into three years worth of progress? And, and ultimately what happens is you start looking backwards towards the old national curriculum because realistically, unless you're a subject expert in those things, you know, I, I, I'm subject leader for mathematics and numeracy and some of the wording in, in some of it, because it's been written by mathematical experts um, and, and it's the same for all of them. It's not just math and numeracy. I'm just speaking from a mathematical point of view. Um, the, you, you have to kind of break it down based on what it is you're trying to, to deliver for your particular age in your class. However, I, I'm aware of that with, you know, it's, it's progress and everything is, and it's supposed to be about the individual child, not the, the group. I know we've, we've spoken a lot about groups today, but again, actually a lot of the, the guidance is, is, is supposed to be geared towards individuals. So realistically, you can have a, a pupil in your class working a progress step one and someone working a progress step on a really extreme level, a progress step four. Yeah. And, and, I and think, it just opens it up even further. And I think you, you've pretty accurately described what an enormous task, just making decision of where to start it is. Damien, do you want to add something? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, for me, I think the, the progression steps are um, obviously they're very useful, but I think they should just be used to, for curriculum design. Um, they should absolutely not be used as a, and I, and I think I, David said this many times to be fair, they should not be used as a, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a tick list as you go through. So for instance, looking at progression step four, um, from the science and technology, when I can describe the interdependence of organisms and ecosystems and explain how this affects their chance of survival. The last thing you want to do is say, right, today I'm going to give them a, a, a quick task and I'm going to get it in and I'm going to give them a tick. You know, so I, all the, you know, every pupil, all the progression steps, and I'm, today we're going to see if we can tick off this particular progression step for. I think progression steps should be used to design your curriculum, but if we're going to use them as a, as a, as a tick list for individuals or for groups, I think that's going to be a, a disaster because we're just going to be you know, um, recording progress, not learning. Absolutely. And one of the things that we've been working on, I'm just going to, Barry, I know that you want to say something. I mean, if you look at the land use literacy and communication um, statements in the, the descriptions of learning, one of them says progression step two, I can understand what I have read. Well, how on earth would you assess that? You know, short of getting an x-ray machine on and seeing the little light bulb going on in someone's head, it's in, it's impossible. So you're absolutely right that, that they, they are not to be assessed against and Welsh Government would be clear about they should not be used as assessment tick lists. Barry? Yeah, I think another aspect to this that um, I think we need to bear in mind as well is that, like I said last time, this is meant to be a curriculum from foundation phase up to GCSE. Now, we need to think about the quality of um, data that is passed between the schools um you know so so there needs to be a shared understanding of what that progress looks like what whatever it looks like between the two schools because otherwise we're just starting off again you know i don't think we're moving forward or making any progress one of the one of the things that i think is going to be crucial is that the clusters have to work together to thrash this out mm. i don't think you know so those progress steps as we said they're far too large it needs to be broken down and and that will be completely different in different subject domains as well yeah and so, it might even be i mean when you say you know the clusters need to work on that i mean when we're thinking about children moving schools moving regions you know coming in from other yeah. countries really we should be saying that the nation needs to work on this you know that we need to have some kind of understanding of what uh if we are going to yeah. measure that what is expected and it's it's almost like a catch-22 you can't really 
solve that equation without thinking about some very, very difficult questions. Sam, sorry. I, I just, again, I, I think it's not, it's not, we shouldn't be starting with those statements. We should be thinking about the curriculum and fundamentally what it is our students are learning and having discussions around that rather than, then, you know, I mean, I think like, like Damien said, if I, you know, I think about I'm an English teacher, if I think about kind of, you know, progression and look at those statements within LLC, actually, what are the fundamental concepts that underpin the study of literature? And what am I going and how am I going to enable students to understand those? How am I going to teach those? How is that going to look in primary and how and how is it how does it look different in secondary? And, and those kind of conversations without getting hung up on you know, are we, as you said, is this a list of kind of, of progress that we're going to take as they go through? Because I don't, I don't think that's what the new curriculum is designed to do. I don't think that's what it's about. Um, and I worry that we're coming at it sometimes when we have these discussions from the wrong direction. Yeah, um, and I, that is a, a really difficult question to ask. And all the time that we're talking about, but we shouldn't put it on the descriptions of learning, that we shouldn't start with the statements and then work backwards. We are expecting a level of expertise from teachers to be curriculum designers that is going to grow over time that, that a lot of teachers out there may not yet have. And that's why this all seems just such an enormous challenge uh, for, for teachers to think about what progress is and where they should start, Sam. It, it is, it is. But I think it's also a really exciting discussion to have with, with colleagues. And, and, and actually, it's also, it's making us think about what is really important within our classrooms and thinking about those concepts that students really fundamentally need to know in order to be, you know, effective students or, or to, you know, to deepen their knowledge and their understanding in these different domains. And I, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing for us because I think somewhere along, you know, I, although I look terribly young, I've been teaching and teaching quite a long time. And actually, I think even, you know, over my career, I feel like, I feel like that's kind of got lost. And yeah. it's quite exciting to be able to kind of go back and really think about that um, rather than getting hung up on, you know, I think some of the things that we, we found ourselves doing as a profession. Um, so this is, this is an opportunity to reset mm -hmm. assessment, to reset how we develop progress. So this is a real opportunity. I'm very aware of the time, Dave, um, if you can be relatively succinct, um, yeah. if you could come in, yeah. All I was going to say was the fact that actually what we need to what we need to do is we need to get rid of the things that are stopping us doing all of these things that Sam's talked about. It comes back to exactly the same argument. It's accountability. If this stuff is being used as a stick to hit us, it stops working. So get rid of that and all of these conversations will come to life. OK, that, that's a, a really nice place to kind of stop for the, for the time being, because we're getting towards uh, five o'clock. And I think um, uh, Jane and I had a discussion about can you, and I'm just going to leave this question, I'm not expecting anybody to answer it now because it's not on the list, and this is a question to all of our participants as well, is it possible to, uh, to uncouple assessment from accountability? I'm just leaving that question there. Is it possible to uh, uncouple assessment and accountability? Okay, I think we'll just want to go back to our original poll. And I just think it would be useful just to relaunch polling. Uh, so we're going to start that one again and just see if there is any difference. So we had the, the top option um, was one of the most popular ones last time. Let's just see. So if we can vote on this section again and maybe be a little bit more discerning, maybe and just choose the one or possibly two that you think are really appropriate. Uh, it's quite different, quite different. It's really interesting. People's um, perception of mm. this has changed quite a lot. Okay, they're beginning to settle down now. We're seeing two clear winners this time. Okay. So here it is. OK, so the, the, we're still with the top one moving forward with uh, learning, but we're also positive growth and change. We're seeing a much bigger yeah. difference between those two and all of the other ones now. So that's a really interesting change 
from where we started at the beginning. Well, we are beginning to draw to a close now. So um, because all of our panelists, can I just say thank you so much for having that really fascinating discussion and uh, putting yourselves out there on a wet Thursday afternoon in Wales to discuss curriculum for Wales and uh, what the future holds for us all and the kinds of questions. I think one of the things that uh, I know Jane is probably going to talk about now that the one of the things that uh, has come to the fore is that how complex this really is and how uh, there are still very, very many questions that need to be answered before we're in a position to really move forward with this. And I'm going to hand over to Jane to round up today's session. And I, I'm just going to add, ask the panel if you want to chip in anything that, that we've missed as well in the round up. But that was really interesting. I've just been trying to keep an ear and the questions and, and the polling and everything that's gone, gone on. So I might have missed something. Um, so I think it's really clear that that Curriculum for Wales is underpinned by this whole concept of progress. But I think the issue we're really struggling with is, is how we can really have this shared understanding of progression. And I think that this whole hour has been this discussion of what do we mean by progression? I think we're getting somewhere. And it's, you know, it's a really complex answer that, and we know that prog progress isn't linear um, from all the discussions that we've had. Uh, and whatever curriculum that, that we develop as a school that it should reflect that progress but how that's going to be done is still really unclear it's it's very much a topic I think we could keep talking about for mm. you know a, at least another couple of days as, as it is but we haven't got that amount of time and um, so we know that progress is going to need to be measured um, what is still expected we still don't know we still haven't got that clarification um, but I think moving forward you know it's 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 important but one of those things that I think that I really picked up and I think it's something that that Barry you said is about progress is, is about the, the yes it's about academic progress but we must uh, think about personal growth as well particularly Rachel from what you've talked about today as well about the the individual learner at the heart of it and that holistic growth of people not the progress that we would expect from the measurements that we've that we've had over the past goodness knows how many years so we've got to look at this in a in a completely different way so so um, just just one final word uh, when we're talking about progress is that <clears throat> as such a complex um issue is that we have a profession out there working with teachers working with students with children in schools that have a real understanding of how their children are progressing. And like Dave was saying, you know, sometimes we may not need to measure everything. Uh, sometimes it's on the professional judgment. That is the best way, not just a good enough, but the best way for actually helping pupils to move forward. So our next session, uh, we've got a little bit of a gap now. Our next session is going to happen in uh, September and it's on the third of the purposes of assessment where we're looking at capturing uh, progress. So I, I'm sure tracking will come into that. So we're going to talk about that. And we've got the uh, Michael Childs, who's uh, the expert who's provided our, our film for us. So I think that's a really good one. But I also think it'd be really interesting now, um, if you have any questions or any comments, please use the hashtag Let's Talk Assessment. Let's keep talking about assessment between now and the next session, because I think this conversation is definitely not done. And finally, may I say thank you so much again to our panellists. It really has been a pleasure to talk to you today, to listen to all your ideas and your uh, thoughts on this uh, difficult subject. I think despite the fact that it is a really complex subject, you all did brilliantly. So thank you so much for that. Can I, can I just add in there as well that apologies if you have asked a question today, yeah. there literally hasn't been time for me to get a word in. Because <laughs> last time I was poking for to stop, but there hasn't been chance today but, um, but we will try and pull those questions together um, and we can pick up on some of those in September um, yeah. but again if you want to use the, the let's talk yeah uh, assessment do. hashtag then please do and we will yeah and, and we'll, we'll have a look at those questions if we can put those questions out there and link them with you know potential answers you know maybe we'll be able to do yeah. that as well because you don't want to miss anything so sorry if you haven't had your yeah. your question answered. We, we'll link them under the film link that we'll put out next week yeah, on, yeah. on Twitter. So same again go. next week, we'll put out the uh, link on YouTube and please share it as widely as you possibly can. Uh, let's keep talking. So thank you all for your time and we'll see you all in September. Bye now. Thank you.